Well, good morning, Life Church. Let's stand to our feet. We're here to declare there's no one more trustworthy than our God. He's true to his word, and we're going to speak his word over our lives this morning as we worship him. Amen? Let's sing together your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. And your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but your mercy is wide, because you're good on your promise. Let's declare it. I'll take you at your word. If you said it. I'll take you out to it. Cause you're good on your promise. You spoke, and the chaos fell in line. Well, I know, cause I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life. And I want to be on it It's a narrow road And the tide is high Cause you parted the water I'll take you at your word If you said it, I believe it I've seen how good it works If you start it, you're completed I'll take you
You deserve the highest praise. We know you're faithful to your word. From the very beginning, you said you would send a savior to die for our sin. You're faithful to your word. You said you would overcome death and we would have everlasting life in you. So we give you praise this morning. Let's declare found in your name. Found in your name, the power to save with only a whisper mountain shake. Jesus our hope and strength. You made a way. You made a way. You unlock these chains. Here in your present strongholds, freed by the love you gave. We sing together, we give. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. Can you give them your all this morning? Everything you have, lay it out before him. We thank you. We praise you. They're on a tree. They're on a tree. The merciful King, broken and shameful all to see. The Father laid down His Son. From darkness to light, death lost to light.
has overcome because of what you did so we place our trust in you God and we give our worship to you let's sing together we pour out our Your grace. 
Exalted Lord, as your glory fills this place, we join with heaven in worshiping you, our King. Let's declare in faith, He's here. You are here. I worship you. You are 
That is who you are. You are promise keeper. You're a miracle worker. And you are light in the darkness. And you deserve all the praise. The highest praise. You deserve all the honor and the glory. And all the praise. Jesus. And there's no one like you. And we worship you today. Thank you Lord. Thank you. And even when we don't feel it, by faith, Father, we know you're working. And even when we don't see it, by faith, we shall live. The righteous one shall live by faith. We know you're working. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord... The round of applause that is deserving of the highest praise. He is worthy to receive all the praise and all the honor. We worship you, Jesus. You deserve our best. You deserve our best. There's no one like you. Jesus, you reign. And we give you all the glory to you. Wow, what a beautiful time and powerful time of worship. Uh, welcome home. Welcome to Life Church. We uh, pray and know that uh, you're, you feel the presence of God in this place. We are in His presence and we are going to be changed today and leave this place full of hope and faith. How many of you believe that? That God is working in your situation. God knows exactly and He is working. He never stops. Well, church, welcome once again. Before you're seated, find someone around you and just greet him and tell him it's so good to see you today. Those watching online also welcome in the balcony as well. Greet one another and tell him it's good to see you today here in the house of the Lord. And once you've greeted a few uh, people around you, you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting. We have great things going on um, right now in our church. This is a beautiful season. Uh, we have connect groups going on uh, already. So if you haven't, if you haven't um, been part of a connect group, just text the word connect or groups to our church number and you'll get the directory. Also, the ladies have an event coming up soon on May the 4th, that Saturday. So just text the word ladies to the church number and you'll get all the information. We want to encourage you to be part of that. And uh, if you're here for the first time, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let us know you're here uh, for the first time. We want to welcome you and just help you in any way in your journey of faith and your relationship with God. Whatever the step, what that step is for you, we want to help you take that next step. There's a form in front of you in the seat pocket. You can fill it out. You can also text the word connect and you'll get the, the same form in digital in a digital digital way. So we, uh, we just want to open the door and give an opportunities for us to connect with you and tell you, hey, thank you. We want to help you in any way we can. Also on Thursdays, we meet here every Thursday and pastor was sharing this last uh, Thursday. We've seen miracles of healing in our church of people who've been praying and we've been praying every Thursday. Some of you, some of those miracles uh, maybe are here. Uh, and, and we celebrate what God is doing. So if you have a prayer request, uh, please uh, let us know. If you want us to pray together with you, there's a section there that you can write your prayer request. And also let us know, I want the church to help me and to join with me in prayer. And every Thursday at 7.30, at 7 p.m., we, we gather here and united in prayer and see God move. Just like the song that we sang. He's a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And even when we don't feel it or see it, he's still working. That's, that's who God is. Now let's get ready to 
worship God also now with our giving, with our tithes and offerings. And I wanted to uh, share with you this as a way to prepare our hearts to give. You're also going to see the church number again and just text the word give or use one of the forms in front of you. And today let's worship God. And as we do that, uh, I wanted to share this with you. Our pastor was, was sharing this in our Bible reading plan. In, in parentheses, if you want to join us in the Bible reading plan, it's called the One Year Bible uh, Plan. Uh, you text the word Bible to the same number, and we provide everything you know uh, that you, you um, that, that you that you need with, in the same number. So just text the word Bible, and you receive the the Bible plan. Just click on that link, and you'll join us every day. Pastor uh, Tim uh, it shares um, something about that that reading. And yesterday, we have this passage from Luke 12, and I thought it was very appropriate to read today to help us get ready as we give. Um, how do we measure our life? The uh, pastor was asking that question. How do we measure our lives? What are the things that are important that really matter? And Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 15, he says, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. You see, in our world, um, life is measured by how much you have, how much you own, how much you keep. Right? But in the kingdom of God, it says it's not measured that way. And Jesus down in that passage says it's measured by how much you give. That's what, what Jesus was trying to teach in this passage. But worry about finances, money, and possessions, and also about priorities. And he, he says down in that passage, it says, it's not measured by how much you have, how much you own. It's about how much you give. And also he says, you know, don't let all these things dominate the, you know, your, your, your thoughts, but put things in priority. Seek the kingdom of God first and live a righteous life. And all these things shall be added unto you. But keep priorities straight. So how do we measure our lives? Well, not by how much we can keep, by how much we can give. And that's the principle also in the kingdom of heaven. So today we have an opportunity. God, let me be a vessel to give. Out of this house, because of your giving, we give to those in need. Sandwiches to the homeless, people in the streets. Uh, street evangelism, giving clothing and food and also uh, Bibles and pray for them, salvations. I think that last Saturday we saw four people give their lives to the, to the Lord because of the street evangelism, evangelism efforts from this church. So church, thank you for everything that you do and also for what you give. Your generosity is making a difference. So uh, let's measure our lives like Jesus said, not not by how much we own or keep or keep to ourselves, by, but by how much we give. So let's get ready. So <clears throat> let, uh, you can text the word give. And today, let's give and say, God, thank you because you are working through our lives to bless other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time of getting, uh, gathering together. We've sang and worshiped through music and declared that you deserve the highest praise. There's no one like you. And that you are promise keeper. You're light in the darkness. You're a way maker. So, Father, we want to pray right now that you bless every person giving today, every single giver, giving with a cheerful heart. And, Father, we pray that you help us be an extension of your kingdom. And as we give, that your gospel, your word, will continue to expand and change people's lives. Thank you, Father. We pray your blessing and favor in everyone, in Jesus' name. And we say, amen. Amen. Let's see what's coming up now for uh, Life Church, and also prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord. Welcome to our service. We're glad to have you join us today. Here's what's happening this week. Join us for Celebrate Recovery on Monday night at 7. It's a safe space to heal from hurts, habits, and hangups. 
If you're a young person, don't miss Resonate Youth on Wednesday night at 7, a special service for middle school and high school students. Come together for United in Prayer on Thursday at 7 p.m., a dedicated time to seek God in the middle of the week as a church community. Connect groups are small groups that gather weekly around shared interests to grow in faith, fellowship, and fun. The spring session is in full bloom, and if you haven't yet, we would love for you to join a group. Text GROUPS to the number on the screen or click CONNECT at lifechurchcentral.org to sign up. Our Ladies Luncheon is coming up on May 4th. Text LADIES to the number on the screen to register. It's going to be a special time of fellowship together. Don't forget to invite your friends. Parents, Summer Blast 2024 is happening from July 8th through the 11th. Your kids will not want to miss this, so make sure to mark your calendar. Welcome Home is happening today. If you would like to meet our team and find out how you can get involved here at Life Church, join us upstairs for Welcome Home right after service. If you would like to contact our team with any questions, prayer requests, or next steps, please fill out a Connect card. You can do so digitally at lifechurchcentral.org or by texting CONNECT to the number on the screen or the old school way by filling out the card in the seat in front of you. Simply drop it off at the info booth on your way out today. Now, let's prepare to receive today's message. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you. We welcome you today. As you have heard, uh, we want to take a, a second to welcome anybody who might be with us for the very first time. If that's you, we hope that you feel right at home. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our church. Uh, we, one of the reasons it's called Life Church is because we believe that God came to give us new life, abundant life, and eternal life. And today, that's all the things that we're experiencing. Uh, I know that in the moments of, of praise and worship that we had today that you could sense God's presence, even if that's a new thing for you uh, to, to see that type of expression in worship, because one of our core values here as a church is passionate worship. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to worship God with stringed instruments and with loud cymbals, and maybe that's new to you, uh, but it's actually all very biblical. And it may seem super modern, but at the same time, it's extremely ancient. Uh, this form of worshiping God. And so uh, we do all that because we want to see Christ be magnified and glorified. And that's our heart. And when we do that, the Bible says that if he is lifted up, that he will draw everyone to himself. And so you may feel something different than you've ever felt before. That's the presence of God. It's the love of God. And we hope that it just absolutely embraces you today and that you'll leave this place encouraged, full of faith, and feeling different in a good way. Uh, you saw some incredible things on the video announcements that are coming up. We're super excited. Uh, the event for the ladies coming up here in May. Uh, summer Blast this summer for, for the, uh, the kids from Life Kids. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time together. And today, right at the end of the service, we're going to have something called Welcome Home. And that is a way to get to know us a little bit better. We do this about once a month. And all of our pastoral team will be waiting for you at the end of the service today. We'd like to just take a moment to greet you, to answer any questions you might have, to tell you a little bit more about our church and what your next steps are uh, to getting plugged in here as a church. One of those ways you can get plugged in is through connect groups. And this week we started our spring connect group session and we're off to an amazing start. If you have not joined a connect group yet, you can still get into one. There's everything you can imagine. Uh, there are prayer connect groups. There are Bible study connect groups. There are sports connect groups with things like volleyball and pickleball. Uh, I came this last Friday night to one of the volleyball ones. Had an amazing time, except for when I went for one ball that was going out of bounds and uh, lost my footing. And next thing I knew, I was looking at this beautiful ceiling here in the lobby of our sanctuary. Um, and uh, that, was, that was special. Uh, did not feel old at all. Did not feel like a grandpa at all. Not at all. Uh, anyway, it was a great time. A lot of, lot of fun time of fellowship and, uh, and get to know people. Uh, that maybe you've never met before. So we'd love to explain more about that to you, how you can serve, how you can 
become a part of a connect group or if you just want to come and meet us and ask some questions, you can do that. It's a, it's a kind of a, uh, a, a reception type format um, and real casual. We're not going to make you sign any blood covenant or anything weird uh, like that. You don't have to give your life away uh, to Life Church for the rest of, of your days. Uh, it's just a way for you to find out more about, about us. We can answer any questions you might have. So we're going to do that today right after the service. It's going to be upstairs in room 204. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. And, uh, and come and find out a little bit more about Life Church and get a chance just to meet you and greet you. All right. Well, we're going to continue today a series on the book of Romans. So Romans is the first epistle or letter that we find in the New Testament after uh, the four Gospels and then the book of Acts in the New Testament. And we, it's 16 chapters long. And I think today is part 23 that we're doing on this series that we started last fall. But this is a huge long letter, the longest epistle that there is, 16 chapters. And it is so, so deep on all the things that we've learned of things like being justified by faith, that we're not ashamed of the gospel, about the wrath of God, about the grace of God, all these amazing principles. And so uh, if you look at the Bible, there's the New Testament. You zoom in a little bit more. There is the book of Romans, the 16 chapters. You zoom in a little bit more, and we're going to go to chapter 5 today. Uh, we started a couple weeks ago in chapter 5, and I'm just going to remind you of how it starts. It talks about how, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. What we understood is that these two verses explain to us three very important things about our relationship with God. First, we have peace with God. Second, we have access to God. And third, we have hope in God. And then when you look at verse 6 of chapter 5, it says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Notice the phrase there, at just the right time. What is that talking about? What point of time is that referring to? It's kind of three different things. First, in the history of humanity. From a very practical standpoint, a historical standpoint, the time when Jesus came to the earth was during the reign of the Roman Empire. And one of the things that the Roman Empire did, even though there was other great civilizations like the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and then, of course, the Greeks right before the Romans, the Romans, one of the things they were known for were their roads, their highways. And this opened up an avenue, literally, for the gospel to be able to be shared all over the world in a pretty quick amount of time. Also, Jesus came at just the right time in the calendar. We studied a couple weeks ago on Palm Sunday how there was a ton of prophetic significance to the fact that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, what's known as the triumphant entry, on the particular day that he did, right before the Passover, when the Lamb of God was going to be selected, or excuse me, when the Lamb for each family was going to be selected, the Lamb of God rode into Jerusalem and said, here I am. And then also, he came at just the right time in our story. I don't know what your story looks like right now, but I want to let you know that Christ is here for you at just the right time in your story. Then in verse 11, it says, So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is an amazing truth. We have been made friends of God. If you feel like God is really distant, if you feel like he's this mean judge in the sky just ready to pounce on you, I hope that you understand this verse here from Romans, that we have been made friends of God. So that gets you up to date. Uh, last week was Easter Sunday, and we shared on the subject that God has another robe for you. Uh, and we looked at the different robes that Jesus wore from the time that he was a baby to during his ministry to when he was crucified to when he was resurrected. 
And we looked at the parallels of that with Joseph. And then we talked about your life and that God, if you feel like your robe has been stained, if your robe has been torn, if the enemy has tried to rob you of your identity, God has another robe for you. And so last week being Easter, we took a little break from our Roman series. So I just kind of wanted to get you updated here as now we continue the rest of chapter five of the book of Romans. So if you've got your Bibles, look with me in Romans chapter five, verse 12. We're going to read these 10 verses from 12 to 21, and then we're going to go back and we're going to tear them apart. We're going to look at them. We're going to dig in deep and look at word by word, phrase by phrase, what these things mean for you and I. But first, let's kind of get an overview. You ready? Let's read. It says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Verse 14. Y'all can help me back there. Verse 14 says, Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Verse 16, please. If y'all can go back to 16 for me. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Verse 17, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Anybody grateful for the grace of God today? Verse 21 says, So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want to talk to you today about the power of one man. The power of one man. You notice in this passage multiple times it references because one person did this, then many people were affected. Do you know that our actions have consequences? Your life has consequences on your friends and on your family and on your workplace and in your school and in your neighborhood. As a society, our actions affect our city. The way you drive affects people's emotions in our city. Now y'all brace yourself because tomorrow is the eclipse and you know there are people that have flown in from all over the nation 
to come because Dallas is going to have one of the best viewing points, this area here of the Metroplex, of the eclipse, as long as it's not cloudy. Unfortunately, they're saying it might be pretty cloudy and might obstruct the view. But when people start coming to our city, whether that be for a one-time trip or because our city, thank God, is a city that's growing and we have people moving in from all over the United States and from other parts of the world, you and I are going to affect the environment. We're going to set the tone. When you walk into your school, when you walk into your workplace, the way you live in your neighborhood, the way you greet or don't greet your neighbors, it sets a tone. Our life has more power and more influence than what we might realize. But of course, pales in comparison to the two lives that are contrasted here in Romans 5. So let's take a look. Let's dig in deep here. Uh, I know some scholars believe this is one of the most difficult passages in Romans to understand. I think it's actually pretty straightforward. It's really a compare contrast between Adam and Jesus. The first Adam and the second Adam. So let's dig in and and look at, at what it says. In verse 12 it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. Okay, so let's kind of look at this in a linear way. Uh, let's just kind of break it down phrase by phrase. Here, here's what happens. Adam sinned. Sin entered the world. Sin brought death. Death spread to everyone. Everyone sinned. You kind of see it's kind of like consequences, right? It's a cause and effect. And, and, and we can all get mad at Adam and say, gee, thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, because of you, sin came into the world. Because sin came into the world, death came into the world. And because of that, all of us have been affected. Now, here's the, here's the thing. We were all, even David, the psalmist, talks about this. We were born into iniquity. We were born into sin. And the reality is that we can all blame Adam for that. Okay, because that's where it started. Now, a lot of times when the first sin is talked about, Eve gets a really bad rap, right? Especially male chauvinists. They're like, see, it's because of Eve. That's why we all messed up, right? But the reality is that in this passage, I don't think Eve is ever mentioned. All the responsibility is put on Adam because ultimately it's his responsibility whether he sinned or not. And here's the thing. While we would all like to blame Adam, more than likely if we had been in Adam's shoes we would have done the same thing. How did sin enter the world? If you go back to the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, the word Genesis means beginnings, what you find is that God said, hey, you can have anything here in this garden. You can eat of all the trees except for this one here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what were Adam and Eve tempted to eat from? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you want to make someone want something, tell them they can't have it. They may have not desired it before, but the minute you tell someone they can't have this, all of a sudden they really want it. That's called human nature. That is called rebellion. And unfortunately, it's in all of us. If you don't believe me, if you've ever tried to diet, and there's lots of different kinds of diets in the world, right? And some of those are by eliminating a certain type of food. So for some people, it's I'm going to eliminate kind of really fatty foods or I'm going to eliminate really kind of sweet foods or a lot of carbohydrates. Now, you may not have been craving carbohydrates all week, but the minute that you go on a diet that says you can't have carbohydrates, you really want carbs. You really want that piece of bread. You really want that cake. It's in our nature. Unfortunately, the minute someone says, you can't have this, we want it. I read a funny story about a pastor who preached a sermon, an entire sermon on sin and pointed out 65 different sins that the Bible explicitly names. 65 sins. At the end of the sermon, someone from his congregation came up and said, pastor, thank you so much for that really, really interesting 
uh, sermon on sin, um, there were a lot of those I haven't tried yet. So thanks so much. I thought, hmm, that's not maybe where I was wanting that to go. The minute we mention something that we can't have, unfortunately, rebellion inside of us, human nature, sinful nature, automatically wants that. It's like if I were to tell all of you, whatever you do, do not imagine a pink elephant. All of you just imagine the pink elephant right now. Because that's just the way our brain works. We, we imagine things that people mention to us. And we have curiosity. And this is what Adam experienced. Let's go on. Verse 13 says, Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Okay, so this, is, this part's a little bit deep to understand. But let me break it down. Sin existed before the law. There were people who, who killed, there were people who lied, there were people who cheated before the law of Moses, uh, about 1,500 years before Jesus comes, on, or, or longer than that, excuse me, before Jesus comes on the, the scene, there was, uh, there was sin. It existed in the world before the law. But the law just highlighted the sin. It just gave it a name. It just said, hey, you know that thing you want to do sometimes that you've done? You're not supposed to do it. That's the way the law worked. But people were already sitting before the law. The law just highlighted it. It would kind of be like if someone uh, was, was spending money left and right, not really paying attention, and using their credit card and getting loans. And, and all of a sudden, one day they realize, hey, I'm running out of money. I don't have enough money. And so they sit down with a financial expert. And this person helps them make a budget. And there's a ledger. Okay, this is how much money you're making on this side. This is your income. And this is how much money you're spending on the other side. These are your expenses. And if you do the math here, you realize you are big time in debt. And you are spending way more than you are making. Now, that exercise of sitting down and speaking with a financial expert did not change that person's behavior. All it did is highlight what their behavior was already doing. That's the way the law works. The law of Moses given to the children of Israel when they come out of bondage and slavery in Egypt on their way to the promised land simply highlighted this is the debt you have. These are the wrong things you are doing. You have a debt that you cannot pay. Verse 14. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So what Paul explains here in this passage is that Adam was a real person. There was an actual guy named Adam. His name means humanity. And even though he was an actual real person, it wasn't some allegory about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were the very first two humans God created here on earth. That even though they were real people, they also are representations. Adam is a symbol a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Adam was a symbol of Christ, and Jesus is like the second Adam. It's kind of like a start over, a redo. We go to verse 15, and I want to start showing to you, start, start highlighting a few, different, um, a few different words here that we find in, in verse 15. Uh, you notice I've highlighted the word gift you're going to see some words that are repeated in this passage multiple times. We've talked already about sin. Sin is mentioned a bunch in these 10 verses. And then the word gift. You're going to notice it in several different places here. It says, but there is a great difference. Okay, right there we find out there's going to be a compare contrast. There is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater, say with me, greater. greater. Even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So now we're going to set this up. 
the old compare contrast, okay? So if you're into boxing, we could say in this corner we have Adam, and in that corner we have Jesus, right? So let's, let's think about, from what we've read and what we know about these two different historical figures, biblical figures, some of the differences. In the case of Adam, we have a forbidden tree. In the case of Jesus, we have his obedience to go to the cross, the case of Adam, we find sin. In the case of Jesus, we find this free gift called grace. Because of Adam, death came to many. Because of Jesus, grace abounded. Then we look at verse 16. We're not yet done with our compare contrast. Let's dig further. We're going to add more to these columns. And then if we look at verse 16, it says, And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. Remember, we're talking about the power of one man. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. So here, let's continue that compare contrast. Now we're going to add condemnation that we all received because of Adam. And then justification, being made right with God because of Jesus. In verse 17, it says, For, this, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. We've talked a lot about sin. I've highlighted for you the word gift because we want to make sure that we've understand, understood this from the very beginning of Romans all the way through now. That it's not by our works. It's not a paycheck. It's a present. It's a gift that we receive through Jesus. And now I want you to notice another word or phrase. Death ruled because of Adam. Grace rules instead because of Jesus. And the rest of this passage, you're going to start to notice these types of terms, to reign or to rule or to govern. So let's look at 17 again. We just read it, but now we're going to read it kind of looking at through that lens. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. That's like a kingdom term, right? But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. So notice this. One act of sin by Adam brought condemnation to everyone. One act of righteousness by Christ brought righteousness to everyone. I hope this makes you grateful for what Christ did on the cross. It's the power of one man. In the same way that one man ruined it for all of us, another man redeemed it for all of us. Verse 19 says, Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Let's break that down again. Because Adam disobeyed, many became sinners. Because Jesus obeyed, many will be made righteous. In verse 20 of Romans 5 says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. 
But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. You can never out the grace of God. The enemy, because he operates on condemnation, tries to make you think you're too bad. You've done too many bad things. Your thoughts are too incorrect. There's not enough grace to cover that. I want to let you know that no matter what mistakes or how many times you've made those mistakes, there is nothing too great for the grace of God. It is abundant. This phrase that Paul uses here in Romans 5 is only found in one other place in the Greek in the New Testament. And the best translation of it would be super grace. It is abundant grace. It abounds. It overflows. There's plenty of it. It, No matter how, how big it seems, there's enough to cover all of it. And maybe the enemy has made you think, you know what? You don't deserve God's forgiveness. Well, actually, that part is actually true. None of us deserve it. That's why it's a gift. Because see, none of us deserve a gift. When someone gives you a present, it's not because you worked for it and you earned it. I, bless God, I earned this. Give me my birthday gift. No. No. Someone gives you a gift, it's because they chose to. You don't deserve it. It is a free gift. It, it's funny because in, uh, when, I, when I create these PowerPoints, I, I create all these PowerPoints for, for the sermon preparation. And, and, and so the spell check, uh, you know, will catch if I've misspelled a word. Or there's also a grammar check, right? And it will, it will underline if it feels like there is a grammatical error. Um, or in, in, in some cases, so when I, when I type out the, the phrase free gift, it underlines it. And, and it, you highlight it, and it says, this is redundant, unnecessary, right? Because it's kind of true, a gift is free. It's the free gift, right? Like you don't, you don't I, I don't come to you and say, hey, last week was my birthday, so... Here's $30, go buy me a gift. Right? It's a free gift. Uh, but, but that sounds redundant, but we need to emphasize it. Because it is a free gift. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. Now, some of you guys are freaking out and going, he just talked about there's nothing we could ever do that can't out, you, know, you can't out sin the grace of God. And are you just saying we're going to just keep on sinning? Well, you got to come back next week and read chapter 6 with us. Because that's exactly how Paul starts the very next chapter. With a question. So then should we just keep on sinning? So I'm just going to leave it hanging there for you to kind of be wondering about. you got to come back next week to find out the answer. Okay? But right now, what Paul is having to emphasize, remember this is 16 chapters. And if you look at just one passage... All you're going to find is the wrath of God. Or as I told you, I listened to a, a, a Welsh preacher, a guy from Wales in the 1950s. And, and I love British accents, but, but I guess people from Wales, they roll their, tongue, their R's like people from, from Mexico do when they speak Spanish. And so he says, the wrath of God, right? So if you look at just one passage of Romans, all you might see is the wrath of God. But if you look at another passage, all you may see is grace, of God. Another passage, you might just see a big focus on sin. Another one, you might just see a big focus on the free gift of grace. We have to look at this in its totality. So I I hope I'm keeping a balance here for you. But today, as we zoom in on this section, we learn about super grace. That grace abounds. It's more than enough. For any of us in this room. Then verse 21 says. So just as sin. Ruled. 
over all people and brought them to death. Now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you see those, those, those words there I've, I've highlighted? We looked at a couple of them a minute ago in another verse as well. You see this term, to rule or to reign. These are what's called kingdom terminologies. Now, there's a lot of different forms of government uh, throughout history. The United States is actually not a democracy. It's a representative republic, right? Um, it is like we don't, we don't vote on every single law that's passed. We vote on people who are going to vote on the laws that are passed. Okay. Later this year, because this is an election year, and since this is, you know, not at all divisive and not at all controversial, uh, you know, to talk about politics, especially from the pulpit, um, I'm going to talk about who you should vote for. I'm just going to let that linger out there for a little bit as well. And if you want to find out who Pastor Tim thinks you should vote for, then you're going to have to come back later this summer because I'm going to talk about it to you because Romans talks a lot in the latter part. The first eight chapters of Romans are super theological, and the last eight chapters of Romans are super practical. And it includes things like civic responsibilities, like our duty as citizens of a country. Now, for some of you, just got really nervous and kind of maybe like, hey, I don't know like why a pastor's talking about politics. I think that, you know, Polit pastors shouldn't get in involved in, in politics. The reality is that in our lifetime, politics changed from being about spending and highway construction and foreign policy and military spending to extremely spiritual and moral issues. And we have to talk about it. And for those of you who might think, oh, well, what about separation of church and state? I'm so glad you brought that up. Because the point of Thomas Jefferson's letter, which is the only place in any American document that the phrase separation of church and state ever exists. It's not in any legal document. It was a letter Thomas Jefferson wrote. was not so that churches would not be involved in politics. It was so the government would not be involved in churches. Hello. Separation of church and state. Because that's what we left in England. Where there was a mandate that everyone has to be a part of this church. See, my heart is that everyone would come to know Jesus Christ. But that's not the job of a government. We've been there, done that, and tried that. That doesn't work. So, what has to happen is, revival has to start in our heart. Our minds have to be renewed, and when we do that, we will become better citizens. We will have a better society. We're not going to be perfect until Jesus comes, because he's going to bring a whole new kingdom that is going to change us, and, and it's going to be like nothing you've ever experienced before on this earth. Now, that was a very long parenthesis to my first point of here to rule or reign is the kingdom terminology. There's lots of different forms of government. Okay, so in the Bible, you find one form of government called a theocracy. That's where like the children of Israel says God is the one who anoints and appoints our kings. Okay, the United States is not a theocracy, representative republic. Uh, there's been dictatorships, there's been fascist leaders, there's been all kinds of different forms of government. The country where I was born in, because my parents were missionaries, I was born in Costa Rica. Henry Kissinger, a great uh, political mind, said is actually the purest form of democracy in all the world. But you would probably find it kind of annoying. Because before they can put up a new street light, there's an opportunity for everyone to go vote. Because that's actually what pure democracy is. Everybody votes on every single thing. And it's not very efficient. <laughs> I'll just let you know. So you may love a particular type of government. Maybe you think that's actually really cool. And you're like, I want it to be a complete democracy. And maybe some of you have experienced what it's like to be under a dictatorship. And you know the pain and suffering that that's caused for millions and billions of people throughout history. Um, but the reality is that what we're presented with here 
If you look at the gospel message, it's a kingdom mentality. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So no matter, one of the things I'm going to teach you this summer is that we have to look at the fact that we might get really inside of our little bubble here and have a, a very much a 2024 Biden versus Trump viewpoint of the world. The reality is the United States is an extremely young country. Humanity has lived for 6,000 years. The United States has been around for like 200 and whatever it is now since, 19, since 1776. The United States has existed officially. And like 150 years before that, when pilgrims first started arriving here. And before that, Native Americans that lived on this land. So the reality is that it's a lot bigger perspective that we need to have. And so we'll zoom in to what we're living, and then we'll zoom out and look at history, and then we'll zoom back in and see how we should react to it. But the reality is that we have a kingdom opportunity here. We have a tale of two kings, King Adam or King Jesus. Which kingdom do you serve? Jesus said he came to bring the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is near. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What, what, a, what a monarchy, what a, what a kingdom mentality requires is a king. You have to have someone who leads a kingdom. A kingdom is not everybody's the same. No, a kingdom means there is a king. And a king usually requires to be respected, to be honored, and ultimately to be served. Now that might rub against our, bless God, I'm an American. I'm a Texan, right? America kind of mentality. But the reality is, that when you serve God, you're a part of a kingdom. And the leader of that kingdom is Jesus. King Jesus. So we have these choices. We have these contrasts. You can serve Adam or you can serve Jesus. But you got to choose. Which kingdom are you going to serve? There's some phrases in the Bible that relate to this, what we've talked about here from Romans, and what I'm sharing with you about this kingdom mentality. For example, the idea of born into sin or born into iniquity. The psalmist talks about that. Versus what Jesus gives us the opportunity to do is to be born again. Not a physical rebirth, but a spiritual rebirth. That means in our life that we should have two different birthdays. The day when we were born physically as humans here onto this earth. And the day when we are born into the kingdom of God. We are born again. Jesus referenced this. He talked about being born of the water and of the spirit. So it's our choice. The interesting thing about this monarchy, about this kingdom, is it's a kingdom where you get a vote. You can vote for King Adam, or you can vote for King Jesus. But whichever one you vote for, you're going to serve and you're going to pledge your allegiance to. And you're going to live the consequences of their decisions. And we saw in that compare-contrast columns the consequences of serving King Adam and the consequences of serving King Jesus. I would go with Jesus if I were you. Instead of condemnation, the free gift of grace. You see, Adam covered himself in guilt and he ran from grace. But God has another robe for you. The robe of of righteousness. If we choose Adam, we receive judgment and condemnation. If we choose Jesus, we receive the free gift of God's grace and justification by faith.
This is the power that one man can have. Would you stand to your feet with me today? I want to pray for everyone in this room before we leave this place. Would you close your eyes? Heavenly Father, as Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, we realize that we have a choice. That we can just continue on living under the lineage of Adam. That sin, the death that that sin brought and all of its consequences and how that spreads to all of humanity. Or we're presented with another choice because you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believes in you would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And God, I pray today that everyone would choose King Jesus. That we would serve him, that we would worship him. As we have sang in our worship songs today, he alone is worthy. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You're the name that's above every other name, King Jesus. Who is this King of glory? The one that was celebrated when he rode into Jerusalem prophetically fulfilling his role as the Lamb of God. God, we don't want to continue living under condemnation and guilt. We choose the free gift of grace. We choose Jesus. Today I want to give you the opportunity to choose Jesus. You're presented with a choice today. And I pray that you would choose Jesus. With every eye closed today, you want to make that choice. Maybe for the very first time in your life, or maybe celebrating 10, 20, 30 years of serving in the kingdom of God and serving King Jesus. Today, if you choose Jesus, would you just lift a hand towards the heavens and say, I choose Jesus. Come on, church, say it. If you believe it today, if that's your choice, would you just say, I choose Jesus. Maybe someone here today has never made that choice before. I want to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to ask the church to pray it with us together. I want you to say these words knowing that God, your Father in heaven, hears these words. And he receives you through the lens of grace. Through the filter of mercy. Because he is love. And he loves you so much today. Would you repeat after me? Say, Heavenly Father, I give my life to you. I choose King Jesus. Teach me your word. Show me your ways. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. So if you just said that prayer for the very first time in your life, we want to celebrate that with you. Or if you just said that for the first time in a long time, maybe you've kind of been kind of drifting away from the things of God and you're ready to come back and serve with all your heart the kingdom of God. We want to celebrate that awesome decision with you. And uh, so there's a couple of things you can do. Number one, we'd love to talk to you right in person. Like as soon as the service is dismissed in a second, one of us as pastors will be standing right down here and we would love to 
talk to you, answer any questions you might have, pray with you, celebrate with you, or just shake your hand and congratulate you, whatever it is that you need today. Uh, if you would prefer, uh, you can fill out a Connect card, and it's one there in the seat pocket in front of you, uh, or you can do so digitally by texting the number there on the screen. And for those of you who are watching online, of course, texting is going to be the best way for you to follow up, to take your next action step after the decision that you've made today. We're here to serve you in any way that we can, and uh, we're so glad you've been with us. A couple of action steps for everybody. First, we'd love to see you this week in a connect group. Uh, connect groups uh, happen throughout all the week, beginning on Monday nights with something called Celebrate Recovery, uh, which is a great way to get to know other people, to be able to share uh, what's going on in your life and learn about hurts, habits, and hangups that all of us have. That happens every Monday night here, uh, and it's its own ministry, but at the same, the same time, it's actually not only a part of our church, it's actually an extension of our connect groups, and it's a way that you can get to know other people and learn and study the Word of God and find incredibly helpful tools. And then throughout all the week, there's lots of other connect groups that you can be a part of. Our youth not only have Resonate Youth on Wednesday nights, where it's got cool music and a great word that's shared here, but then at the end of it, they split into groups. It's another form of connect groups that happen here in our church. On Thursday nights, we gather together for prayer. And sometimes at the end of our prayer time, we gather in groups and, and take it another level, right? And form that community. So we'd love for you to get involved uh, in some way this week. You can ask one of us or ask at the info booth there uh, about a connect group and how you can get signed up. We'd love to see you be a part of that community. And then, of course, for those of you who may be new or newer to our church uh, family um, and you've never been to Welcome Home, uh, we'd love to receive you right now upstairs in room 204. It's on the second floor in the back corner there. Uh, you'll see some balloons. There's going to be some refreshments there. Uh, come and have a cup of coffee with us. We'd love to meet you and answer any questions you might have and share with you a little bit more about our church and how you can get plugged in at another level. So thank you for being with us today. I'm going to send you out with a blessing as we're dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed. Have an awesome week. Never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I could do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you.